I now have the tremendous um, delight to introduce to all of you our um, our last and um, and and I think best um, in a string of fantastic keynotes, um, Zachary Drecker. We um, we are we're when. Dennis Doris mentioned Zachary's name as a potential keynote speaker. I was very excited and I'm going to try not to be a big fan girl here. Um, Zachary Drecker's work as a performer and photographer and media producer and human being has received wide recognition, um, much deserved, I should note. Um, and has made a profound impact on contemporary conversations about gender, sexuality, memory, the sense of self and others. I personally love Zachary's work for its masterful mix of flavors. I, um, I don't know that we have a word for it in our language, but the, um, the sense of humor combined with um, bittersweet memory, um, the, the gravitation to the sad and the happy, um, and the sense that they can coexist in the same image, experience, or story is part of what makes Zachary's work compelling to me and to the many others who have appreciated it in various forms at museums, on television screens, through streaming channels, and soon on um, HBO's documentary series programming with her upcoming project, The Lady and the Dale, which we'll be hearing a little bit about. Um, her work is grounded often in um, archives, history, and, um, and personal documentation that taps into the same senses of wonder and discovery that we know very intimately as archivists. So it is with great pleasure and personal satisfaction that I welcome Zachary Drucker <laughs> to um, speak to our EMEA colleague. <clears throat> Thanks, Zachary, and welcome. Oh my god, Snowden, I think that really takes the cake as the best intro I've ever had. Thank you <laughs> so much. And congratulations, Allison. And thank you all for being here and congregating in this virtual space. It's such a gift, I think, to connect in the age of Aquarius, um, the element of air, um, the kind of incredible future that is upon us in which we are able to connect through space. Um, I am broadcasting live from Los Angeles, California as well, the land of the Tonga people. I come from Syracuse, New York, the land of the Iroquois and Onondaga people. And I stand on the shoulders of my biological ancestors who came to the States in the 20th century from shtetls in Eastern Europe and Southern Italy on the other side of my family. And more importantly, the um, many predecessors whose names I know and don't know who were gender expansive in their own times and um, often incarcerated and institutionalized and killed for their difference. It is Transgender Awareness Week this week, um, coincidentally. And today is the Trans Day of Remembrance, which uh, for the past 20 plus years has been a day when we recognize um, trans and gender non-conforming people who have lost their lives due to transphobic violence. Um, and it's very serendipitous. I think that we're all here today, that I'm here. Um, and it's a wonderful gift to excavate the archives with you and to present some of the discovery, my discoveries in 2020. Um, I thought we would watch four films um, throughout the next 40 minutes if we have time for them. Um, the first being a film that I just saw a few weeks ago that was uh, kind of brought to the fore by the stewardship of Susan Milano and uh, it's called Transsexuals. It's from 1970, which as I'm sure you all know, was immediately after Stonewall. 
and in the kind of amorphous uh, period before gay liberation was really organized. And, um, you know, 1973, 74 was sort of a turning point um, in many of the social justice movements um, in which uh, trans people were less welcome after that point. <laughs> Um, I think that this clip just, uh, it's so, as, as a person who's always tried to locate myself in history, try to understand um, where I'm coming from, it's this kind of elusive thing that's not easily or readily available. It's increasingly available, thank goodness. Um, and it's a little bit of a... a kind of job of a creative detective mm -hmm. to mine what's out there. Um, yeah, let's start with a little clip. That's my, <laughs> that's my really? intro spiel. We got a lot to talk about, but um, this clip I think encapsulates such a diverse array of voices from the seventies and hearing these, um, yeah, predecessors of mine, I think will just, warm your hearts. Nineteen seventy one. That was a year off. Who's counting? <laughs> I'm very happy the way I am. Did you ever hear the transsexual institute? Um, right now I'm going under transsexual ex changes for the female hormones to have breasts. That's about as far as I'll go. You would never consider the full procedure? No, because I'm, I, I believe that I'm presenting a valid lifestyle, and this is my valid lifestyle, and people should be able to respect my valid lifestyle like I respect theirs. I had a trick two days ago. Two days ago, there was an officer. Yeah. And he turned trick with me and he said that he was it's all for and he wanted to be legalized. He's a nice officer. Very cute if I must say. How'd you pick him up? Was he on duty? No, he was off duty in a gorgeous car. He was in a stingray. I was gasping when I found out he was an officer. Did he tell us? In a stingray, honey. Did he did you did he find out that you were a man? No. Nobody ever does. I am so oh never. Never. I cross-dressed quite frequently at home, and uh, I ruined most of my sisters and my mother's clothes, <laughs> and their shoes particularly. <laughs> you see, most of them took a size seven, and I used to take a size nine, <laughs> and I used to try and <laughs> I used to try and repair the damage. Can you imagine forcing a big foot into a small shoe? And of course they knew I was into their clothing and everything else, and it was awful for them. Well, how did they feel about it? Well, they didn't know what was wrong with me, and uh, I didn't know. And uh, I'm sure the only person who was anyway aware of um, how deep it went uh, was uh, my mother. You know, I always felt like I wanted to be a girl. You know, I knew that I was a boy, but, you know, like I wanted to be a girl. And always, you know, and everybody used to say, you know, I think that everybody used to say, you know, she looks like a girl, you know, he looks like a girl and things like that. That came to my mind. And it's always been like that. Did you cross-dress when you were small? No. You know, you like I used to wear, you know, like take a dress of my mother and do like this. And I used to do that. Know. <laughs> I, used to, I don't cross dress too much because you know like every time I cross dress I get so frustrated because I look so fantastic. <laughs> you told us you had a child. Have you spoken to your this is a daughter that you have? Yes. She found out about me about a month ago through a friend of hers. And she phoned me up Sunday night and she screamed into the phone. Why did you do this to me? Now what can I tell my daughter who I haven't seen since the age of two why I did what I did? And she thought I was dead for the, for the past two years. Then when she found out I was alive, then when she found out I had a sex change, it was completely shattering to her. So I tried to explain to her in 45 minutes what I had to live for 21 plus years. 
So at the end of the conversation, she said, I have your picture that I cut out of the paper, and I'm going to save it for the rest of my life, and I love you very much. But she opened the conversation saying, I hate you. And she ended it with saying, I love you. Wow. It's amazing that, material. It's incredible. It blew my mind when I saw that. I was just gasping in the words of Andorra Marx. Um, I, you know, subsequently learned that the clip um, in which the young woman is talking about the police officer trick that she picked up um, was filmed in the original Star House, this uh, street transvestite action revolutionaries, which was the safe haven um, for trans folks started by Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. And in a lot of, you know, different sources, Sylvia Rivera had mentioned Andorra Marx and Bambi Lamore. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen photographs of, of either of them or known of any additional documentation of them. And just in corresponding with Susan over getting permission to screen for this, um, I learned that it was indeed this enigmatic Andorra Marx. Uh, who was being interviewed in, in the original Star House in 1971. And I had a long time ago came across this article. Um, I think this is maybe what Deborah Harton was referencing, the, the newspaper article. She had been in the news for, uh, you know, a, a marriage dispute, which happened oftentimes with trans people. Mm -hmm. Famously, Lucy Hicks Anderson and Oxnard, California as well, had lived in her community as a woman. Um, she actually was uh, running a brothel and a boarding house. As and, one does. Yeah, and was <laughs> at late in life, in her, in her 50s, was, um, you know, venereal disease was tracked back to her boarding house and mm. um you know county officials examined her girls and and her and discovered that she was um anatomically male um and she was then you know there was a big court uh you know and and press kind of um moment in which she was outed mm. she served time in prison and um was mandated to wear men's clothes for the yeah. rest of her life as punishment, which she did not do. She came to Los Angeles and <laughs> lived an anonymous life. Um, yeah, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. I'm a huge history buff. Well, I, that's actually <laughs> a, a question I had, and we can, um, I, I certainly want to um, see the rest of the images you're, that you have um, queued up to show, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, the, that feeling of discovery, and I would love to know for you, as, as archivists, we, um, we sometimes forget to how much of our work is embodied and how much of our work is tactile and physical yeah. and um, as well as emotional and physiological. You know, the, 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 the weight of the work that we do is significant. Um, we carry it in our bodies. And, you know, this is part of why we have yoga uh, classes as part of our <laughs> conference yeah. programming, because it really we do carry a lot on our shoulders. Can you talk about how that feeling of discovery um, what what the feeling of discovery is for you? What is it like in your body when you make that realization? Is it goosebumps? Is it chills? Do you get the quickened breath? How how do you <laughs> feel when you discover? I think butterflies would probably best describe it. I mean, I uh, you know grew up in Syracuse, New York, as I mentioned, and my only access to culture was through the library mm. and video, the video store, right? Um, and there was an independent film section. Mm -hmm. There was 
a great array of international films at the library as well. And then and then, there's the around the corner at the video store that yeah. gr grown ups go into. <laughs> yeah, come out totally. With a smile. And that was my conduit to the world of people like me as well. Mm. So, you know, without media, without archives, uh, you know, it was my only uh, breadcrumb path to mm. knowing that there was a precedent for my mm -hmm. existence, for knowing that um, I could have a, a viable path forward mm -hmm. as an adult. And there wasn't much out there. There certainly wasn't anything in my school library. Mm. So, you know, it's the discovery process has happened over, over a lifetime, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the cavalcade that we experience now of media surfacing and media being made is just not something I ever anticipated mm -hmm. seeing in my lifetime. I mean, I think that our survival is miraculous in a way <laughs> that, you know, it's a miracle yeah. that any of us are here. It's, it must also, I think, be profoundly comforting to see people living in community um, as long ago as 1971. Um, and the part of the work of archives is, is um, creating and preserving visibility and, and helping folks understand that, that, that so few things in human life are new. Um, but that, that yeah, it is, it is possible for people to exist in community and create spaces of safety for one another. And that, that often at other times has required so much more work. Um, um, but the, you know, my initial, my, my first thought when the, um, when, um, the person was speaking, I was saying that they they destroyed their sister's clothing and their shoes. Yeah. The, the sense that that when when she said Esther um, Riley is that woman's name. What well, when Esther said, um, they didn't know what was wrong with me and I didn't know either. And it's you know, my initial response is there is nothing wrong with you. And the this the the um happiness of seeing getting to see that people did have community even then um that that is a sort of um, comfort in retrospect and i think the erasure of trans people in history i mm -hmm. mean would create conditions in which how would you know yes. you know like yes. i mean that's the the biggest kind of shame of all is that mm -hmm. um you know we will be born into this world no matter what and um I think, you know, it's this is so crucial that the the records of our existence exist. And these folks are were ordinary people. I mean, all of the the people in the in the clip we just watched, um, with the exception of Sylvia Rivera, who speaks first about her choice mm -hmm. not to have surgery, which was actually just so radical for the mm -hmm. time. And now that's, you know, a much more uh, I think dominant position in the mm -hmm. movement for um, for trans equ equality mm -hmm. um, and time, and the etiquette. The I mean, the shifting mm -hmm. the shifting etiquette too. You would you would never, as a as an interviewer or reporter, inquire about somebody's like surgical choices now. It's just, it's none of your business. Yeah, and it's funny because every conversation revolved around that. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, there's there's almost no exceptions, you know, for, for yeah. decades. Um, and it's something that reverberates today. It's something that, you know, continues, I think, to haunt uh, yeah. <laughs> trans and, and what a, what... people today. And what a what a um, what a like as you say radical but really um, proud and firm assertion that this is a valid way to mm -hmm. be that this is that you know that that um, that, that that choice is valid um, and that there isn't a a one way to be trans um, or exactly. to, to assert a trans identity um, or live a trans life. Exactly. Yeah, and I think I mean the thing that I'm always so struck by in touching these figures through time is uh, some, you know, sometimes how parallel their experiences mm -hmm. are and how, to me, that clip of Sylvia Rivera, I don't know if I've ever seen her on film uh, that early. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't aware of that clip until a few weeks ago. And it's like, she could be saying that in 2020. It's just, mm -hmm. just as valid and just as well stated 
as it mm. was 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, Deborah Hart, and I'm going to flip through a few of these, sure. was uh, featured in Let Me Die a Woman, which we also have a clip of, but I feel like we can skip it because our conversation will be more interesting. <laughs> 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 but um, Let Me Die a Woman, you know, is this, uh, sex exploitation film from the late 70s by the prolific director Doris Wishman, um, who is famous for, you know, Dildo Heaven. Yes. And, and, and Moon was a lady and a nice nude Christopher. on the moon, <laughs> which, um, which screened at the MoMA Preserve and Project Festival. Yeah. Um, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, Doris. Doris is um, much loved within our community. <laughs> um, so you should all check out Let Me Die Woman if you haven't seen it. But Deborah Harton features very prominently in that as well. It's filmed later in the 70s. I, I believe Wishman filmed it in 1974 and 78. She kind of put it down and picked it back up, which is curious in its own right. I mean, I think about the projects that I've made where I've had to put them down for a few years. And it's usually because of pain, basically, <laughs> like dealing with you know, not, not being ready to um, dive in. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I was just perusing through Let Me Die Woman again last night. And I was just reminded of how truly, uh, how much things have changed truly. Mm -hmm. um, I always bring Flawless Sabrina into my day. Um, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful Flawless Sabrina. <laughs> and Sabrina, let me just make this full screen so we're like looking at it and juggling things. Um, and for those who don't know, a little context about the I Flawless will. Sabrina oh, yeah. project. Yeah, Flawless Sabrina, I met um, when I was a young person. I was 18 years old in New York City and you know, I found this documentary, Wigstock, which was made in 1996 by um, Barry, forgetting his last name because I'm on the spot, but he's a friend of mine. <laughs> and Wigstock was happening on the West Side Piers that year, and I couldn't afford the ticket price to get in, but I stood mm -hmm. outside the stage entrance where the performers were coming in and going out, and I photographed a uh, few of the performers and Flawless Sabrina was one of them. And she like stuck her finger in my lens and said, you're on the wrong <laughs> side of the camera, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and I put that photo of her up, like right, you know, on the floor where my futon was. And um, kind of manifested her into my life. And I started seeing her around at the clubs. This is her on the left. She was always the oldest person on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. um and never got off the dance floor she would just be the life of the party really fairy god monster yeah <laughs> exactly and that's us together on the right and flawless was um ooh, now i'm frozen flawless was uh impresario of drag contests and she would um travel the country, organizing local talent, and uh, you know the culminating event. This in 1967 was at Town Hall in New York City, and it is the Queen, which came out uh, on Blu-ray this year, and it was such a gift. Flawless passed uh, three years ago almost mm. to the day yesterday was her your heart site and um you know the film was on vhs it, it had never been re-released mm. um but we were able to screen the print of it that existed and um you know due to that one print existing, I was able to watch the film many times with Flawless and hear all of her stories about how the film came together. And mm -hmm. with the release of the Blu-ray, it was such a gift because journalist uh, Diana Torje, who's Sabrina's biographer um, and a tra also a trans woman friend of mine, we did a commentary on the Blu-ray. So if any of you are interested in 
hearing more, um, we just had this tremendous opportunity to kind of pull back the curtain and share mm-hmm. the many things that we know about the queen from <laughs> our relationship. With, what you don't see flawless. is what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then from, from the shoulders down. <laughs> yes. How much um, work is going on? Totally. And then too, like in this restoration that Kino Lorber did, I believe like UCLA Film and Television Archive, um, you know, we'd found reels under Flawless's bed um, after she passed and we donated them um, to wow. UCLA. So there's, you know, this, yeah, we found a lot of cool stuff. And through organizing Flawless's archive, we uh, met the living contestants from the Queen who mm. are Marlo. Miss Chicago, Alfonso from Miss Ch- of, of uh, Chicago. She's uh, the third runner up. Um, Miss Emery uh, of Atlantic City is still alive and living in wow. Las Vegas. And Rachel Harlow is um, still alive in Philadelphia. Fantastic. And yeah, connecting. I would just say, you know, that Flawless was so monumental for me and just my development as a human and an artist um and in every way and that I feel like the the history that I have um gleaned over the years has largely been oral histories it's largely Mm. been talking to people so these are photographs from Marlo uh in Chicago Monique Mm. Her name, she goes by both Marlo and Monique. Um, And she was very close with Crystal LaBeja, who is still- Of the House of LaBeja. Yeah, the originator of the House Mm -hmm. of LaBeja. And Crystal kind of steals the film at the end. Of course. And as she's um, kind of like reading everyone for Phil at the end, she- continues to like refer to Monique and she says Monique is a friend of yours Monique is a friend of mine not a friend of yours darling (laughs) (laughs) and I was always like who is Monique and then I met Marlo I found out she went by Monique and I was like was that you and she was you know anyways she she didn't remember but when I she's just Liz Taylor with better makeup this (laughs) is Monique Taylor and that's who Crystal was talking about. And I did not see that until the film restoration. Amazing. And it was clear as Easter bells. Mm-hmm. Crystal LaBeja is standing next to Monique Taylor out of drag. And I was just like, nobody even knows who Monique Taylor is today, but at the time in the sixties, she was mm-hmm. like the, you know, premier female impersonator. She was, mm-hmm. She was the Liz Taylor of drag. Amazing. Amazing. What a gorgeous creature. Right? It wasn't until the restoration that I was looking at this on the big screen and I was like, that's Monique Taylor. I'd kind of like put, and it's Mm -hmm. just this kind of puzzle. that It just snaps into focus. Yeah. So so beautiful. There's many things about the, the queen restoration, like things that I learned and... But this was an exciting one, was just seeing Monique Taylor out of drag. Amazing. There with Crystal. <laughs> yeah. We just have a couple more minutes, and I want to make sure that um, you get to tell some more of these stories. Um, I know that yeah. you've got more slides. Can we, yeah. can we well, tell us what you've plug, got? I'm also going to plug Disclosure. Oh, this is going to be the Cliff's Notes version. I'm going to go real quick. Um, <laughs> disclosure, my favorite these are all my 2020 moments um was this uh you know clip from 1980 with these three trans women and i recognized the redhead and i was Mm. like i recognize her as amanda winters Uh, yeah that chin that jawline unmistakable who i have uh you know these uh all these vintage trans magazines of and i'd always been fascinated with amanda winters like what happened to her she died at 27 years old Mm -hmm. um 
and you know, I kind of put it out there into the world on Instagram, and this is what came back. It was wow. a magazine that I didn't have in my possession, but just kind of detailing that Amanda died in a plane crash, a small yeah. private plane carrying, you know, trans performers in yeah. 1981. And um, she was buried as a male, <laughs> which was mm -hmm. very typical and tragic. Uh, I've actually lived to see one of my friends uh, presented male in a casket as well mm. many, many years ago, but nonetheless. Um, this is Heather Fontaine, one of the other performers on the show, and Shay Lee. And it makes the, the, the um, Doris Wishman's work, you know, the idea of let me die a woman, that, that assertion is still so heartbreaking and powerful and relevant decades yeah. later. Yeah, really is. And um, the, the project that I'm working on currently is the story of Liz Carmichael, who promoted this three-wheel car at the height of the oil crisis in 1974. Um, and Liz was outed as trans um, by an investigative journalist and outed as a convicted felon on the run mm -hmm. and uh, kind of opened this huge can of worms of, of her long history as a petty criminal. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating person, fascinating life. And in searching for archival material to tell Liz's story from different angles, we came across um, so much of the incredible work that many of you listening, I'm sure, have, have done um, to preserve some of these stories. And one of them is uh, Jennifer Michael, who is in both Pat Rocco's changes and Penelope Spheris's I don't know. And mm -hmm. if we're going to watch one more thing with the minutes we, we have left, I unfortunately can we can't. I've just been told okay. we're at time. But um, but if um, yeah. if it's a clip from the upcoming project, we can plug it and say that. Um, stay tuned. Um, get your HBO and HBO Max subscriptions ready to go so that we can um, you can enjoy more of Zachary's work. Thank you, Zachary, so much. Thank you so us. much, Snowden. Are you kidding? It's been tremendous. The pleasure is all um, mine. And it's, uh, the honor was mine. And <laughs> um, and we we are so grateful you could be with us. And um, I want to just wish everybody else um, who is tuned in for the conference today a great conference. Thanks for being with us. Please join us for the membership meeting um, at 12.15, 12.30. I can't remember exactly when. Um, but we, we will have another chance to be in community together as, as a membership. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks to all of our presenters. Congratulations again to Allison. Um, and have a terrific Friday, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.